Welcome everyone to the Rowski Talk for this evening. If you can please enter the room. We're about to start here. Um, we're very excited tonight to have Danielle Dean with us. And just a few announcements before we have her student introducers. Um, next week we have performance artist and scholar Martin O'Brien, who is here from London. Is that right, Amelia? Yes. Yes, and um, he is also going to be performing on the 12th. Um, and do you want to give the information for that? Yeah, he's performing with Sherry Rose at Last Projects, which is a gallery in Lincoln Heights, it's called. Um, front, and it's a directional performance. You can come anytime between 2 and 6 p.m. And that's on November 12th. And I'll, I'll try to remember to bring some flyers on the 8th. Yeah. Okay, so that's going to be um, the next lecture and the last of the MA MFA lectures for the semester. We hope you will join us then. I'm going to turn it over to Jenny Lynn, who also has an announcement. Hello, I just wanted to remind everyone that the MA exhibition, We Are Close in Distance, featuring all kinds of fabulous artists, is opening this Friday, and there is also going to be a poetry slam in the gallery. They are installing as we speak, uh, 6 to 9 p.m. this Friday, so come on down. Um, and now, without much further ado, I will introduce our introducers. They are Muna Malik, MFA candidate, and um, Ishan Shing, MA candidate. Thank you. So uh, we are tasked with introducing Danielle. Um, thank you everyone for being here tonight and thank you for giving us the opportunity to be here to speak tonight. Um, so Danielle Dean is a British American visual artist. Uh, she was born in, uh, to a Nigerian father and an English mother in Alabama and brought up um, in the suburb of London. Uh, she studied fine art at the Central St. Martin in London and received her MFA from the California Institute of Arts. Uh, she's an alumni from the prestigious Whitney Independent Study Program and the Scout Indian School of Painting um, and Sculpture. And through a multimedia art practice uh, that spans painting, installation, performance, and video, Danielle Dean's work examines how our minds and bodies are colonized by media and cultural production, and her work often reflects on the influences imposed on us by marketing strategies and how our subjectives are constructed within the web of the capitalism. So, drawing from the aesthetic and the history of advertising and from her multinational background, her work explores the ideological function of technology, architecture, marketing, and media as tools of subtraction, oppression, and resistance. She recently worked on a new commission for Performer 21 New York, which showcased a live performance called Amazon Hotsey, and she has just finished a solo exhibition at Tate Britain in London with a similar thing diving into the relationship between human labor and artificial intelligence. Other solo shows include Triple Talk at the Louvre of Germany, True Red Room at the Museum of Contemporary Art Detroit, Bazaar at 47 Canal in New York, and Landed at Cubic Gallery in London. Her work has also been included in group exhibitions, just, such as the recent Whitney Biennale in New York, Freedom of Movement Aesthetics Museum in Amsterdam, anti access Biennale in Athens, Greece, the Center Cannot Hold a Lab by the Anticipation in Paris, Artists Film International at the Whitechapel Gallery London, and Made in LA at the Hammer Museum in 2014, among many others. So without further ado, please welcome our guest speaker, Daniel Dean. Well, thank you so much. That was such a wonderful introduction. Thank you. Um, okay, just before I start, I'm going to try not to speak too long, but please stop me if I'm like rambling on and be like, no more, because we can totally end. Um, so yeah, thank you so much for coming um, today. Um, so I'm just going to warn you that we are, as already mentioned, that uh, my work is really um, multimedia. Um, it's including video, drawing, sculpture, um, and something like a type of social practice. Um, I will show a selection of works, and I will uh, try to highlight and um, show you that there's like a lot of research that goes into the projects and um, 
interactive and archival. Um, and the research um, often influences the outcome. So the medium that I use is really influenced by what I'm looking at. So I'm driven by an interest in how the subject is constructed in relation to capitalism, how our behavior, language, relationships, and even our personality are interpolated or um, influenced or brought to bear by things like our advertising. Race, age, gender are not essential, not primarily biological, but markers that have been historically determined and have been articulated um, by many things, but I really look at it in terms of consumer products. So the word ideology is a key term in the work that I make, um, whereby material relations um, generate ideas and beliefs that become embedded in the representation. Um, and so, you know, these things get repeated and uh, become what we call current dominant ideologies, or they become part of a central common sense view of the world. Um, things like class status, um, sorry, this is not always just about class status, but is also about the construction of race and gender, um, and racist ideologies are represented in media, like, for example, this advert that we're looking at, um, generating schizophrenic perceptions um, and as Frantz Fanon famously described it, these representations circulate in the form of media and commodities around the globe. Um, so I started to think about how capitalist ideology is also about colonialism, um, not only because of the material network of um, raw materials from the colonies, um, goods and advertising that circulates globally, but also because of how it operates within a power structure, um, whereby a lot of advertisements um, historically have been um, centered on white ideals. So then I'm just going to start talking about work now. So this is a really old piece from, not I mean, maybe not that old, but from 2011, and I actually made it when I was a student at CalArts. Um, and during this time, I started to look at archives and think about how history has influenced or had an effect on our racist capitalist present. So this early work is called No Lie, um, and that the lie is spelled L-Y-E, which um, I'll explain why in a second. Um, and it was made in 2011, and one is one of the like moments of change for me in terms of the, the work that I made. And, um, was really important and it was one of the first works I used performance to reenact and reinterpret archives of advertising. So this piece uses advertising copy, um, so essentially the slogans and things that you find in adverts, um, from found magazines such as Ebony, Essence, Vanity Fair and Vogue, which have particular targeted audiences based on race. So the archive started in 1946 and extended all the way to the present. Um, and so I would mention No Lie was the title, which was actually a slogan that I found in, the, um, um, in one of the adverts. And it had like a double meaning. It basically was like, oh, we're not lying, or we don't have lie, L-Y-E, which was actually a type of bleach that was used in a lot of hair products, which was really damaging to your body and hair. Um, the copy that um, was often things like skin, like the copy for these adverts were things like um, ranging from hair relaxing cream to things like skin lightening cream. So five women, including myself, who I have to say I really can't act, so it was like a real challenge to be in all of these works, but um, I saw it as a good one because it was really not necessarily just about acting, but about thinking through the performance of the self in a way. Um, so we all like gathered together in my bathroom in Highland Park, um, and we followed a kind of Brechtian method where we intentionally created a gap between the words that we said and a kind of soap opera-inspired drama performance. So a bit. 
I don't know, it was kind of slightly exaggerated but also deadpan at the same time. Um, words, language and sound were literally floating inside of the bathroom um, like um, what Stuart Hall calls floating signifiers. Um, for Stuart Hall, race is a signifier that is relational and not biological. Um, and he was thinking about how language is um, sometimes um, uh, has these things embedded in it, but are not essential and can be maneuvered and moved around. So I thought about rearranging advertising copy and playing with its delivery um, so that new meanings could arise. And so also another thing about the soap opera-like performance was that I really love soap operas and when I was growing up in England, um, I used to watch EastEnders all the time, which probably none of you know what that is. But EastEnders is a soap opera that happens every week, and it, I think it's shown every three days or something, every other day. Um, and it's um, it's kind of amazing anyway, I probably shouldn't get into that, but it feels very grassy and actually it's, it's sometimes feels so live. And anyway, so um, actually also serial soap operas um, so, you know, East End is something that isn't, is pretty old, but it still exists now, but apparently soap operas in themselves started as an advert, and they were created by soap companies in the early 20th century to market cleaning products to a feminine audience, and they were a lot about teaching people how to become consumers and how to, like, relate to the things that they um, were, you know, wanting to get them to buy. Um, and they integrated these products into their emotional lives um, and thought about, you know, orientating these, these products around normative gender roles. Um, and language, again, was a big part of that and they often used a lot of metaphors for the products for emotions. Um, so anyway, the, this video was thinking about a lot of those things and um, essentially we used the copy and assembled it together um, it's essentially in the time that we were making. So the script was a lot of copy cut together and thrown around the wall, um, and it mixed together political speech about immigration, and we just played around with the words in the performance. Um, and what I wanted to do was subvert the notion of individually beautifying oneself alone in the bathroom but instead these women were collectively using these words and, and it was implied they were actually making a bomb. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, so I'll just show a little clip of it. It's really bad sound because it's pretty old, but anyway. <laughs> Um, advertising, 
um, and like how you know this co-option, like whether there was a way to re-co-opt it um, in a positive way. Um, I developed the piece with a number of women, and um, one of them actually was Mire, who was in um, the previous video. Um, and we did this through a series of workshops that actually happened during the shoot also. So similar to No Lie, a lot of the copy was just plastered around the walls and we played around with it during the shoot. And another note is one of the participants of this video is my past sister Astris, who's sitting in the middle of the set. So here are some examples of adverts I was looking at. Um, these are video stills from um, TV commercials. Um, I found that Nike appropriates and empties out a lot of politics and creates an illusion of collectivity. Um, individualism and, and competition are also celebrated a lot of the time in these adverts, um, which is obviously ideal, so it's ideal for capitalism. Um, some adverts use violent language, for example, um, a 1988 advert that I found, um, it was like the first TVC they ever made, and <laughs> this woman addresses the camera and says, oh, it wouldn't hurt for you to stop eating like a pig, like as if being really violent to other women would be the way that you would want to buy um, Nike products. But they kind of ended up realizing that that wasn't the way to do it, and so ended up appropriating a lot of feminist slogans instead. Um, so this is a video still from a Nike commercial by Spike Lee, um, who you probably all know is a really famous um, film director. Um, and this video, is, this advert is called The Urban Jungle Gym, where colors and patterns it are kind of really suggestive of the discourse of multiculturalism that was really big at the time. Um, I was thinking about multiculturalism as another form of co-option where diversity was being recognised on a superficial level. Uh, the recognition of symbols and cultural signifiers of difference were covered by, you know, that these things covered over the fact that in the 90s that a lot of terrible things were happening, like the massive rise of mass incarceration and, um, yeah, a lot of awful things. And so I kind of was interested in thinking about that abstraction in the set. Um, so the set alludes to that and it also was appropriate from um, Nike shoe designs. Um, and the set alludes to this liberal corruption of difference through aesthetics, um, but it also I was thinking about the history of uh, revolutionary abstractions such as Russian constructivism. And then the other thing about the video, and I'll show a clip in a second, is that um, I also appropriated a lot of camera angles from the Nike commercials. Um, that have certain cognitive associations, one could argue, because it's this sort of history of the, these representations. And one was this famous um, camera angle that um, was panning down, um, like a, a kind of objectifying the subject. Yeah, they are. 
we have a miss today of work? Free 5.0 plus. about how this history is really related to 
the surveillance that we have now. So it's kind of crazy to think that like something that happened loads and loads of years ago that is entangled into the issue of slavery has a big part on how um, you know there's a lot of technology is used to maintain the property of black people now in some ways and, and like the relationship it has to police violence now. So, <clears throat> but more than just a singular site of control, Elamina Castle became a model for many other castles that were built along the coast. So in terms of media, it means that it became kind of a pattern that got repeated. Um, and so for, for German media theorist Frederick Kittler, all media are systems of storage, processing, and transmission of, of information. So the castle could store not only goods and people, but also the technology or cultural technique to produce more castles and to sort of, um, and, and, and the subjects that the castle needed to reproduce its logic. So because the, the castle act, also acted as a storage device storing gold and slaves, there was accounts of bookkeeping that I found, like actual people, like, you know, um, how do you say, archival material that um, showed this. And so I was thinking about this building as a type of um, history of what, it, what all the different things it could have, it was, like a warehouse, a prison, and, and I thought about it in relation to the present. And so um, the video, True Red Ruin, considers these connections of the past and the present. Um, and so what we basically did was me and my sister and her friends, we reenacted some of this history that um, I found in the archives and through workshops and stuff. I worked with, uh, this is my sister Astris, who lives in Third Ward in Houston, Texas. And so we set up a, basically a prefer red castle in her um, community and um, you know made this video work that was re-performing that history. Um, the castle that you see in the video is also a standee, um, which is like common technology of branding displays. Um, so again, making a relationship between the circulation of these ideas through the story, the kind of original flat back of the castle, but also um, banding display systems that can be sent around the world. Um, and so we imagined the castle being built in the middle of my sister's housing estate in Houston, Texas, thinking about what it actually was, um, a prison and a warehouse, and through workshops we thought about ways in which power is embodied and how the technology of the building or a cell phone because I was linking those the, the building to a cell phone which I did a whole experimental lecture about so maybe I could try and I'm not going to explain that whole thing of that now but anyway um, thinking about those media forms as, as surveillance and control and we thought about the panopticon effect of the cell phone resulting in self surveillance and commodification. And then, so technically in the video, basically um, the props were made from um, maps of Elamina Castle. So this is a drawing made that is from historic, historical maps and I took the castle out and just drew the landscape and then the landscapes became um, cell phones, how do you say, cell phone backgrounds in the video. Um, and then this is an installation view of this piece that um, is being shown right now at the Sedlik in Amsterdam. And then I'll just play a clip of this. And I
about this project too much because I'm conscious of the time, but um, I also, um, after this project, I worked in another archive um, of a building, actually, and this one's called BHB, Bazaar de Hotel de Ville, uh, which is basically a shopping centre built in the centre of Paris and was first built in 1870. Um, I gained access to a shopping ca catalogue um, from 1980 to the present, so they're still making these shopping catalogues, um, and they send them out to people um, all around France. And I was interested in this being pre-Amazon, the online re retailer, um, and the archive, it shows the history of objects and consumer goods and how they're being presented through photography and um, images and, and drawing, actually. Um, and I was thinking about how this contributed to a French identity and a type of nationalism. So BHV was located in the centre of Paris and um, only certain Parisians would go there. Um, and so I worked with some women who lived in the suburb of Paris and some had never stepped foot into BHV. Uh, these women were mostly second generation immigrants from France's old colonies such as Guadeloupe, Algeria and Martinique. So in some workshops that we did, which actually spanned the course of two years of us working together, we examined and discussed the pages of the archive. Um, and this page is from 1909, was the um, only woman of colour that we could find in the archive, which is insane. Obviously we didn't look at absolutely every page, but anyway, that's still the same. And despite the French colonial history, um, and also the thing about it is that um, she's there to show off the whites of the sheets, um, which, you know, um, it was interesting because it was a question of, um, of, of like how objects and people are represented and how people can be represented as objects. So we discussed our personal experiences also through these workshops of being second or third generation from Africa and the colonies. <clears throat> so the video takes these discussions and ideas and um, creates a part documentary, part fictional video where the women journey through the pages of the archive unfolding into the real streets of Paris. This is an example of an archive page from the 60s, like when there's like a army of white appliances. Um, and through digital images, it became a scene in the journey that the women were, could inhabit. Um, and the work really, it, it, explores the complex relation between people and objects and people as objects. Il faut trouver une issue. C'est compliqué de trouver qui on est lorsque toutes ces choses vous parasitent. And, in, and it's in French. <laughs> so, um, let's skip that. So this is the final scene who uh, Emily um, who you can see here is dancing crump next to a giant co coffee machine. This is what? Um, 
you, you know, copying that and thinking about that as a medium that is part of the history of advertising. And so the series is called I'm Hiding It Here, and the date of the um, shopping catalogue archive, which in this case is 1921. And the uh, women in the video are all hiding in the pages of the archive. So I don't know if you can see that in this piece. And then um, I, for the installation of this piece that was shown at 47 Canal, I've not got all the images of it, but basically there was a series of standees that were made, and so the piece became like a five, I think a five channel video installation, and this is an example of one of the um, views of that. Okay, so the final project that I'm in right now, but also, and, and how do you say, leaving, but it was a while I was in this um, project. So when I was living in Detroit a few years ago, I got obsessed with Ford because Ford was everywhere there and, and because it's basically where he um, produced all the, um, he produced cars from Dearborn in Detroit. So I got access to an archive of Ford ad advertisements. Um, and so this is an example of a Ford ad from 1924. I was interested in the representation of landscape because that seemed to be a theme that went through this archive significantly. Uh, the car is often positioned in the front um, and uses the technique of perspective where the human is always at the center of the landscape and also the consumer product of the car. Um, early Ford car ads were often hand-painted, so the obsession of watercolour and gouache continued through this work. Um, before, basically this was before they um, used photography and digital imagery. But what I was, thought was really striking about seeing the fact that these early adverts were painted was because it has a closer relationship to the imaginary in a way, and um, what it does is show you that even the photograph that you think is perhaps more truthful has also been painted in some way and it is not real. Um, and so there's like a history of that. And so I was thinking about this collective effect of these images on the imaginary and how it affects our way that we see the natural world. So uh, there was also a connection between the assembly line that, um, so this Fordist assembly line that Henry Ford used to um, build cars where he essentially um, all discrete, oh God, I'm trying to explain Fordism, but where things are made separately. So one person would be on the assembly line doing one thing over and over again. So it's like a, apparently a really more efficient way of making um, things. So I was interested in this mode of production and how it relates to um, representation and con constructions of the American dream. And so these two drawings are exactly from, they're basically taken from this advert that we, you just saw. So they're redrawings of those things, those advert, advert in, in layers, in sections. And so um, it's basically using a multi-plane camera effect, which is big, it was a big deal with, with Walt Disney. Um, and so Walt Disney was obsessed with Ford and Fordist methods of Taylorism, um, where the car is separated along the assembly line. Um, and for this, this connection between um, Disney came out in multiple ways, but the multi-plane camera is one version of that. Um, and so I really got interested in that and decided to make my own animation with the multi-plane camera using all of the history of the Ford um, car ads. And you can see in this imagery, um, this is a Walt Disney animation that you can see online, but I just took a still from it, but you can see how the multiplane camera operates, and actually originally it was a big apparatus that was made from car parts, um, so yeah, in the effect of representation of landscape that becomes an efficient assembly line, it ignores the complex 
um, ecologies of actual nature in, in the world um, and splits it up into these discrete things. Um, the production of images and the imaginary has an effect on the real and these depictions um, put humans at the center of land and when split like this can justify extracting from it as if land can be pulled apart and extracted for our own use. So the animation is a bit maybe apocalyptic in some way. Um, there's no people in it and no cars and just the landscape split up in this really bleak, multi way and it rolls on and on through these different landscapes for over 20 minutes. So I'm just going to show a little clip and maybe talk. documents like this one which show the rational organization of the rubber plantation. The archive was um, from the point of view of the managers um, and for example this was a list that was showing the damage that the workers had done after a riot um, but there was actually no accounts from the workers themselves just a literal list of all of the money that they had lost because of what they had damaged. So I was like Again, similar to other archives I was looking at, I was like, oh, what's, what's not being told here? So I wondered how I could think through this archive and what wasn't in the archive and think about it in the present. Um, I thought about post-Fordism now, um, so essentially that being how did Ford, the Fordist assembly line explode outside of the factory and become really a part of our life and the globe in various ways. Um, <clears throat> and so um, I was thinking about that and so that like the ways in which, you know, um, organization of our day and, and how labor is organized is really influenced by Fordism. And then I was also thinking about rubber um, and how that used to be a big commodity and what's a big commodity now. Um, Apparently it's data, um, so apparently data is really big business and um, you know it's being used for multiple th different things but one being the future of artificial intelligence. So I began researching a, another type of work organization um, and this time it was the Amazon but not the Amazon the place but the internet retailer Amazon 
and more specifically Amazon Mechanical Turk, which is a company that Amazon own, which started in 2005 and is an example of a web work web platform where data is extracted from a massive scale. So AMT is the short for Amazon Mechanical Turk and is a crowdsourcing platform that allows for gathering of mass data from humans. Um, I don't know if anyone's ever been on this site, maybe, I don't know, but um, it's really crazy because they have things like, um, they call the jobs HITS, um, and that is short for Human Intelligence Tasks, and so you go on and you do a HIT, and you might get paid four cents for a HIT, so that means that if you're a person who's doing this work, you have to work all the time, a lot, to get any kind of you know, living wage from it. And this data um, is all about getting human data, so you can't be a bot or anything like this, you have to be a human, um, and, you, and they want information about humans to feed AI machine the learning algorithms. Um, and there's many workers that are situated on, that use this site across the world, but mainly in the US and India, and the workers really get paid absolute, you know, bad money. Not a lot of money. So I decided to try and connect with some AMT workers to learn about their living and working conditions and to reflect on Fordlandia as a case study. And so through a series of workshops, um, we discussed what types of conditions they work in, um, whether the work was fulfilling, what kind of life does it enable, and what kind of future does this type of work suggest. And interesting, like, also this came up from the, the workshops that essentially in some ways their labour and their work is contributing to their demise because as, as soon as AI gets big enough to, you know, take over these jobs, they don't need them anymore. So that was something that was told to me by the AMT workers, which I thought was quite crazy. Um, there are many reasons why people do this type of work. For example, um, if you're laid off for some reason and you can't necessarily go to the office due to um, disabilities or care responsibilities. But also during the time I was making this, it was mostly because of COVID, because a lot of people were having to be at home anyway. Um, so this is uh, Mohammed Wajid's bed. He works for Enter from his bed in India. And this is a quote from him. I work at home during the daytime. I work in the, my, in the living room. And during the evening and night times, I work lying on my bed. I just put my laptop beside me and, and sleep and wake up during the night to check if there is any work available. As of now, I don't mind sleeping on the same bed with my laptop beside me. For me, money is money. It's very important rather than total comfort. Okay, so part of this project also was looking at the Ford um, adverts and thinking about that in relation to the um, AMT workers. And so this is a series of watercolours that I did which was collaging a lot of different um, places found in these Ford adverts and in each one is a place um, of the NAMT workers in the front. So I wanted to kind of think about the, the contrast between being at home and the, the illusion of, of the American dream and the production of the imaginary, like the kind of, you know, like, um, as if we're all free to go on this adventure across the globe or across um, the um, landscape. And so these two things were in contradiction together. And there's a bunch of this work that I have been doing. Um, this one includes an archival photo of Fordlandia, um, the burning rainforest. Um, you can see that it's like actually the rainforest. My I'm pointing to the screen, but you can't see me. Um, there's like an image, there's like a, how do you say, archival material from what the Ford Landia looked like when it was burned. And I'll just flick through these quickly so you can see the variation. Okay, so I'm 
going to finish talking to you about this um, same project in this uh, line, which was essentially all of this research and stuff came together in a project that I did at the Tate Britain called a Amazon. Um, and so in this piece, in Fordlandia, time clocks were smashed during a riot. A whistleblower who had dirt on Ford was accused of being a diamond thief to discredit him. Workers were expected to work during the hottest day, part of the day. Ford insisted workers ate canned peaches instead of the abundance of food that the rainforest had to offer. Um, and the indigenous workers were forced to learn square dancing. Many irrational decisions were made by the managers in Fordlandia as they sought to westernize the indigenous workforce. Um, so the Fordist stream of cultural assimilation contrasts with the conditions of work um, with Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, so in the piece we essentially restaged some of these historical things that happened in Fordlandia as if they were happening um, in the lives of the um, Amazon Mechanical Turk workers. This is Amy. Um, and it kind of did the same thing as the pre two previous pieces I showed where it was like part fictional, part, well, part, not fictional because it was part historical account, so part historical, part um, documentary about the AMT's lives and how it, how, um, how it is to work for, AM, for Amazon Mechanical Turk. And the other thing about it was that all of the footage that was shot of the AMT workers, they shot themselves because it, it was seemed important to think about the fact that they are isolated at home doing the work and also it was during COVID so we couldn't go out and shoot. And so we essentially sent kit, camera kits to each person that had lighting, sound, all, all of the stuff you need to make image, video, and we had to like um, essentially do multiple workshops so that, that they could learn how to shoot um, good footage. And the, the video essentially um, really, I think it was was a good thing because re reenacting these things can be nerve-wracking and there was no camera crew in the house with them so it allowed for the, the participants to feel freer to, 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 to be on, alone with the camera um, and essentially they're reenacting events that occurred in Fordlandia so it was also a way of thinking about it in relation to their, their own lives. Um, this, yeah, this is also part of the shoe. This is the install at the Tate Britain. Um, it was a large anamorphic projection of the back wall and then four monitors in the front and each monitor sort of was as if it was the, the location of each AMT worker, although it didn't have a pure logic. Um, there was also these sculptures of plants growing out of data servers, which remind, I kind of was thinking about how Fordlandia actually is covered in um, plant, like, because it, 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 it failed, it ended up, the Amazon ended up taking back um, the factory. So I'm going to show a clip, so you're seeing it as a one channel video, but it's you have to imagine it not like that, but it's the only way we can show a clip. So, I've been working at Amazon for going on about one and a half years. Um, I started um, primarily because I lost my job. I was uh, laid off, and um, I needed a way to support my family. Um, but I had to stay home. I had to stay home with my kids. I've been working on the Amazon for six years now, and it's been working out pretty well for me, actually. Um, I was searching and searching, trying to find work, um, trying to find a job on the Amazon, and I found this job, and it's actually pretty cool because I get to choose my own hours, I get to choose my own tasks, so like, if there's ever something I don't want to do, 
I just don't do it. It can be thankless. Um, it can be rewarding. Okay, I'm just showing little clips. So this is the last clip I was showing. By bringing back square dancing as well as other primarily Anglo-Saxon dances, we believe we may counteract the unwholesome influence of jazz on America. People will leave the dance halls and cabarets in droves to swing their partners round and round at liquor-free square dance clubs. Jazz is the cause of America's moral decay. The road to repair is as simple as replacing it with fiddles and square dances. Would you say that 
is there a future in which we sell our own data to gain the money for ourselves rather than, even though a corporation will gain that, how long would an economy like that last and then to add the layer of, <laughs> <laughs> to add the layer of um, race, do you see a future in which data from black and brown people will be worth less or more within the context of how advertisement, advertising has worked to and for against these groups? Wow, that's an amazing set of questions. I have no idea how to answer <laughs> But amazing. Um, yeah, I think that any, all of that is possible, but maybe it'd be nice to be hopeful that we might try and change that. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I hope that we can intervene because <laughs> also the future of, of of capitalism is, you know, not um, it, it will destroy the planet, and we need to figure out a different way of dealing with our lives. But um, there's, a, yeah, there's a possibility of like, I mean, I can't remember the separate things, but there's a possibility of all of what you're saying, I'm sure. Yeah, I'm sorry, I don't know how to answer that very specific thing. But, um, but yeah, amazing questions. Yeah. Hi, thank you so much for your talk. It's super fascinating, and I also yeah, want to see you more. Um, but one day soon. Um, I'm, I'm curious, uh, you mentioned your social practice sometimes. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if you talk a little bit more about that dimension in your work, like the, yeah. and the example of the, the red. Castle and uh -huh. neighbor, you said workshops or yeah. your interactions also with these disorders. Yeah, so that's a massive part of the work, which is why it sometimes takes many years for things to be made. Um, and I see all of the stuff that we do along the way as, as I mean, it, it, it's as much as part of the work and the final product in some ways, but it just doesn't. It doesn't matter to me that maybe you might not know exactly what's going on in those workshops, but it does form a part of the work. But um, sometimes things happen during those times where it just feels like that's the most it's really generative. Mm -hmm. um, it's difficult because it, yeah, it's sometimes about connecting people. So with A and T. The AMT project or the Amazon project. Um, one of the big things about it is that um, the site really wants to. I mean, I don't, yeah, it kind of wants to keep people apart, right? Because if they do see each other, or um, like they may demand better conditions. And I think it's not a coincidence that they're just like, this is amazing. No one sees any of each other, and also. The employees do not have to see the workers either, and so that's a massive part of it. So I really wanted to make a work that didn't follow that logic, because there is actually a lot of artists that do make work from it from the AMT site. I, I researched and there's a bunch of different projects, but they all follow the logic of the site where they put out an artwork that is a hit essentially, and they're like, this is a conceptual piece that I'll get art back from people who I don't know and, it, and I really didn't like that because I was like well that's just following the logic of the site which is you know any people who want to make a lot of money it's their dream really <laughs> they don't need to give health care they don't need to care about people and so a lot of the workshop stuff it was like you know I was paying everyone to be there which is really important but it was like also about them meeting each other and I also met there's a big I mean this is a long I'm sorry this is so long but <laughs> there's like a, a, a activist organization called Turf Optican which um, this um, scholar from UCSD set up called Lily Iriani and I also met with them because it was super important to make a work that also didn't do something that would affect them negatively because although you know it's easy for an artist to be like oh let's do something that would take down this evil corporation but actually a lot of people rely on it for money and that it is like a place that they make money from you know and so it's not about 
about saying that Amazon are good or anything, but it's also not to um, be some sort of hero to be like, oh, this is, this, because it will really screw up people's life to rely on it. So that was a big thing that actually Sir Goptican were talking about, is that their fight for it is to change conditions, but not to just take it down and destroy it. So that was another thing. I don't know, that's a ramble that was off the yeah. point, but... <laughs> Also, the work I make is, is because I 
I get affected by this stuff. Like, I think I'm affected by Instagram a little bit too. Like, it, yeah, I have to maybe take myself off of it. Like, it gets into your brain, right? It makes you feel like your life is not good enough <laughs> compared to other people. And so, in terms of art, you think it's like, I think with that, it's like, oh, well, something that looks good and an image might be the best work, when in reality, you, you haven't even seen it in any way. So, yeah, for sure, I think that media is, those forms of media are affecting the yeah. art, yeah. Thank you. <laughs> 